Did you know that over time, your SharePoint sites slowly become orphaned? Yep, site owners leave the organization and the sites that they used to manage no longer have any owners. What's worse is this is 100% preventable with this feature of SharePoint Advanced Management. The good news is you may be able to use SharePoint Advanced Management as part of your existing licensing. Let's get into this and see what it's all about. At Ignite, Microsoft announced that SharePoint Advanced Management will be included in M365 Copilot licensing. Now, this will begin rolling out throughout January, but you need to get ready now so that you know how to leverage all of these powerful advanced management and governance features. Today, we're talking about the SharePoint Site Ownership Policies. So what is the SharePoint Site Ownership Policy? Well, it's part of the lifecycle management set of features in SharePoint Advanced Management, helping you to manage the ownership of your SharePoint sites. It pairs really well with the inactive sites policy as well, which I've covered in my SharePoint Advanced Management playlist. The reason this is here is to ensure that every site has a responsible and accountable set of owners for the content access and the collaboration aspects. If something changes in that, then that's when this policy kind of kicks into gear to ensure that things are back the way you want them to be as an administrator. Now, if you're new to SharePoint Premium or SharePoint Advanced Management, or you're even new to SharePoint, I've got a newsletter that'll keep you updated on all the great features as well as just regular SharePoint. Click the link below to get signed up. It's free, what more could you ask for? So this site ownership policy, it's one of several policies that you can create and even the site ownership policies allow you to define multiple policies to, to manage different types of sites. This is called the scope. So you can create them based on your organizational requirements. Policies can be scoped based on the site template used, the, how it was created, the sensitivity labels, and then the retention labels. You could exclude certain sites as well from this policy if you want to make sure that major sites like your intranet have you know, a different set of rules that it has to follow by compared to a team site or even a classic site. Now we'll talk more about the criteria you can use to identify the sites as well as the actions that you can take on them. But first let's jump into my environment and create a policy and see what this is all about. So I'm in the SharePoint Admin Center and the first thing we're gonna to go to is we're gonna expand policies and you'll see site life, life cycle management. Now, again, this is the feature of SharePoint Advanced Management. So if you don't have Copilot licenses assigned yet, you won't see this. And eventually you'll probably be required to have licenses for, uh, or to have Copilot licenses assigned to all of your individual users, but you could also license, uh, license SharePoint Advanced Management by itself. So you have two different options you can go on depending on what budget you're working with every year. But you'll see in Site Lifecycle Management, you'll see the inactive site policies, which again, I've covered already and that's available in my playlist. But now we've got this preview feature, Site Ownership Policies. So we're gonna click on Open to go into these policies. And I've already got one running right now, but let's create a brand new one. So you'll see an overview of what this thing's going to do. It's gonna be sending out notifications to different people. Again, this is all configurable as you'll see. So let's just click on next and start talking about what we have to work with in here. So first we can specify the site template that was used and we can have something that targets classic sites, communication sites, group connected sites without teams, team sites without groups, and then teams connected sites. So you've got a lot of options to target specific types of things. For instance, if you've migrated from an on-premise version of SharePoint, you're gonna have a lot of these classic sites that you might have just done a lift and shift uh, as it's called. And those might be better sites to keep a closer eye on so that you know when you can clean up all this older classic experience SharePoint, consolidating everything onto a modern experience in SharePoint. But we can click on select all as well to target everything. Then we'll have some options here. We could filter on sensitivity labels. So if we wanted this to only apply to sites that had a particular label, then we can do that. I don't have any sensitivity labels set up in purview, so this option is grayed out for me. We can filter based on the creation source. Now, what the creation source is, if we open this up, this shows all of the different ways a SharePoint site can be created. 
there's the SharePoint Home, which is where the self-service site creation is in SharePoint. Assuming it's enabled, a lot of organizations probably do and should be disabling this so that there's more of a structured and controlled method to create SharePoint sites. But then there's the SharePoint Admin Center. That's how we typically create sites, right? We just go into the active sites, we create the site, we set up the owners. It's the manual method, and it's typically what we do most of the time. But then there's PowerShell. So you could have a scripted approach where you have a, a script that will create something. It could be part of an automation. It could be part of an Azure runbook. So you could have automation set up to handle creating sites based on a help desk ticket that gets put in and approved or other similar methods. So if you've got something like that in place, you may be using PowerShell or PNP because you could be using the SharePoint Online Management Shell or you could be using PNP PowerShell. Both of those options are in here. And then there's the sites that were created as part of teams. So if you were to create an O365 group, if you were to create a team, you would get a SharePoint site along with that. And that targets those specific sites as well. So you've got a lot of options for how you want to choose the, the subset of your sites based on how it was created. Or you could just uncheck this and then it won't filter on that at all. It'll target all of those sites. Again, but also taking into account your other options on this policy scope, things like the site template. Then we can include sites with retention policies and retention holds. So this is a separate option because you may have retention requirements that are are tied to a site based on the type of data that's being stored on that. Maybe it's sensitive data or other types of things where you have, you have regulatory requirements for how long you need to hold on to this information. That has a big implication with this site ownership policy because of some of the actions we can take. So you may want to exclude these sites with retention labels because they have their own process for how they can dispose of sites. And then we've got the, probably the most popular option here, which is to exclude certain sites. This gives you the ability to exclude your intranet or your help desk portal or other things that you may have in SharePoint where really the ownership might be defined as an entire department or something like that. And you want to make sure that none of those sites that could be mission critical are affected by any of the actions that this policy may take uh, as a result of uh, ownership falling below a certain amount. So for now, I'll just uncheck this and we'll go to the next screen. And then we're going to start configuring a lot more with this policy. We have options for who should be in included as an owner in this site because this policy is all about making sure that we have a minimum number of owners. You have two options for who could potentially manage the site. There's the site owners group that has full control over the site, but then there's the site collection admins group, which is kind of the super users and they can manage a whole lot more uh, of that site. So you have the option of making sure that it's just the site owners that are looked at, the site admins that are looked at, or both. So depending on how you utilize site owners versus site collection admins, you may want to exclude, for instance, the site collection admins, because that may be where the IT administrators go in and grant themselves access if they need to uh, perform any administrative duties on the site or help out the site owners. So in that case, you want to exclude that site admins group because that's really not the people who are the day-to-day -day administrators of the site. But everyone's process varies from organization to organization. So at least you understand what these two options are for, and hopefully you have a better idea of which ones you should be using in your policies. Then you specify the minimum number of owners or admins required for each site. Now, it's recommended that you have two, but you have, you, could have, you have to have at least one owner because that's really when, when you have a problem. When you get to one or zero <clears throat> owners, that's when that site's effectively orphaned. There's no one to maintain um, control and manage that site on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's how we got into this situation to begin with to where we need these site ownership policies. So I would recommend keeping this at two to make sure you at least have kind of a primary and a backup administrator. That way if it falls below two, you still have some actionable things that can be done where the backup owner or the remaining owner 
can add an additional owner to the site to bring the level back up to two without involving IT. That keeps us all happy, right? Then you have the option of who should be notified when that 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 we, we drop below that threshold of two in this case. But now if we uncheck site owners, then we do have the option to turn off uh, the notifications to the site owners because if they're not responsible, they shouldn't get the notification. But in most cases, you want site owners checked because they're typically the daily administrators. But we could also include the site administrators as well. These, these would be the site collection admins. You could also notify the manager of the old administrator that was no, that was taken out of the site. So this is a great opportunity to involve the manager in case that person was replaced with a different person. That manager would know about that and could take action to ensure that the new person who came in was the new site owner of the site. Lastly, you've got the site members that you could notify as well so that they can choose a new owner for that site themselves, whether that's promoting from within or asking someone else to help them out. Then the last thing we have to choose from is the action we're gonna take based on the ownership policy. So what happens if the, a new owner cannot be identified? This is something you really got to think through because this will absolutely happen. It's, this is not a, a rare occurrence. People are gonna ignore notification emails. That's why as part of this, you need to include training materials for the site owners and the site members too, so that they understand that this system will be put into place and what they should expect from it. Now, some of the actions you can take, first, you can do nothing. And in that case, eventually these notifications will just stop going out and then it'll show up on reports for you, the administrator, and you'll have to deal with this yourself. Now, that's the safest approach. You've also got the option to set the access to read only. Now, this is get, taking things a bit more seriously and it's stressing the importance to those site members that next time they get this notification, maybe they ought to do something about it. Maybe they take some action themselves uh, before they just lose all right access to the site. So this will set the thing to read only um, because if there's no ownership, maybe this site isn't actually used anymore. Maybe it hasn't triggered on the site, uh, on the inactive site policy, but this could be an earlier notification that maybe this site just isn't used anymore. And the owners have just removed themselves from, from this site. That is certainly a possibility. So you could set the access to read only. Now, there's a lot of other tie-ins with a lot of these policies and features within SharePoint Advanced Management to archive, M365 archive. So you could see an option in the future where you could auto-archive a site. That is a possibility. Um, so look for other actions to come into play here, maybe even firing off a, a workflow in Power Automate. That it could happen. So don't think that we only have two options for good. This is just what we have right now. So let's just say no change in access. We're just going to keep this safe and not, uh, not cause too many waves in the SharePoint ocean of our users. Then we'll click next. And all we have to do is give it a name. And then we have one last decision to make. We have two choices of how we want this thing to run. We can run this in simulation mode where no notifications will go out to users, no actions will be taken, but we'll still get reporting on this. So this is a great way to see what will be the effect of this policy. How many sites are below that threshold. So you should always start out policies in this simulation mode for a couple of reasons. Number one, you just want to lay of the land. You want to know what's, what, what is the state of all of your sites and the site owners. How many sites are going to be flagged for having too few owners? If it's one or two, then that's one thing. If it's 90% of your sites, that's entirely different. So you start out with this simulation mode and you'll get the report and then the policy doesn't do anything else. Once you are ready to turn this on, you can go back into the policy, you can set it to active mode. And from that point on, you'll start getting the reports every single month and all the notifications will start going out based on how you've configured this. So what should you do next if you wanna start implementing this? 
first, if you're an admin, check your governance policy for SharePoint and see what the policy is for minimum site owners. If you've already got that defined, then you can create a policy in simulation mode just to see which sites are in violation. If you don't have the minimum site owners defined, First, you want to determine what that number is. That may involve going to your governance board, that may involve a lot of other people to come up with what that correct number is. Well, you've only got one or two to choose from, but at least you have a decision to make there. Then you want to update that governance document so that the governance is always up to date. Then you can create this policy. And now you can keep it in that, that simulation mode if you want and manually take action as needed. Again, the report will only run once, so you will need to rerun that or recreate that at the, very, at the very least report so that you'll have that every month. But the real power is going to be having this policy active so it'll handle all of these ownership situations automatically. That's the ideal scenario so that it doesn't have to involve IT staff and SharePoint admins to deal with this because site turnover will, will happen as part of just personnel turnover. Now, this is just one of a lot of powerful features in SAM. I've got a playlist covering a lot of these features, and I'm continuing to crank out more content just like this to teach you about SharePoint Advanced Management. So to see that playlist, click or tap the screen, and I'll see you on the next one.